Okay, welcome back. So, um, our last video. So we went. We took a a rough block. We trimmed it down to height, hollowed out the sides, and then cut out the throat and made a step for the ferrule. And so now we're going to take this and we're going to fit our ferrule. So first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to file the side of the ferrule that it's going to go onto the frog like this. So we're going to just clean this up and square it up. Ryan was able to get his base bar fit during the break. Well, it only takes 15 minutes, so should be should have gotten done, no problem. Okay, so we got that squared up, and we're going to take a knife and just put a small chamfer, just basically getting rid of that burr on the inside. Makes it far easier to fit. And remember which side you're using. Yeah, I'll only file one side at first. So, okay. So let's get that cleaned up. So the next thing I'm gonna do is measure the width of my frog. 13.4. Just write it down here, 13.4. And then measure the width of the inside here, which is usually just about 11. 11.3, let's call it 3, 11.3. So we basically, we've got uh, frog is two millimeters wider than the, the inside of the ferrule. So I'm going to take my caliper and make it one millimeter. And so remember, we left this a millimeter and a half tall. So we still have that flat edge here and here. And we can use that to mark out our width of the inside of our ferrule. And we sawed down um, a little bit on each side so that when we um, chisel it back, it's not going to split into the finished frog. And I'm going to use a little bit of extra help here with my eyes. Okay, come on, light. Okay, that's good. The Becker checkers? Yeah. Who is your favorite maker? Favorite maker? Dead maker? Yeah. Dead maker, uh huh. I have, I have um, quite a few actually. I I think, um, uh, of course, Tourt is amazing. Um, I think uh, it's 
I kind of think of the of um, makers in in different periods. You have the first period, which would be Tourt and all those makers that made frogs without a silver underslide. That would sort of be the first period. The second period would be those makers that worked at the Viome shop. And then the third period would be Voran, even though he worked at, at, at the, the Viome shop and later. And um, it's, um, you know, each one of those groups obviously had their superstars. And, um, uh, you know, it's just, it's just really neat sort of looking at how uh, making progressed through those, those uh, different times. Okay, so I'm going to take my saw and I'm going to make a curve that goes all the way around the edge here where the ferrule is going to go. to uh, measure the height of the inside of the ferrule. It's 4.4 and I'm going to make a mark which is that height. Okay, and then I'm going to cut this down. Okay, this is so hard getting that light where it belongs. Hossman wrote, since he missed yesterday's live stream, uh, he has a stick question. What kind of issues can be expected from using a flat sawn stick as opposed to quarter sawn? So if you go back to the first period makers, they didn't care. They made a bow out of whatever piece of wood that they had. In fact, there's a um, really absolutely stunningly beautiful bow that is in the collection of um, Kenneth Warren uh, business, Jim Warren's collection, that literally has the very center of the, of the tree in the side of the head. I think it might actually be pictured in one of the books, um, Paul Child's book on tour, maybe. Um, uh, so that, that group of people, they just made bows out of whatever. And then um, later makers would have gone to more of the quarter sawn, meaning that the annual rings go through the width of the head instead of down through from the top to the bottom of the head. And I, I think there's a lot of concern in modern makers that you, know, you want to use the quarter sawn material because the head is less likely to break and it's the absolute truth it's less likely to break um and certainly for commercial makers the last thing they want to do is you know if they're making hundreds of bows but then they're having you know many bows come back because the heads break um you wouldn't want to do that obviously but um in a lot of ways, I've got some absolutely stunning wood that is flat sawn, and um, it would be a rotten shame to not make a bow out of that. So, I do. So we're cutting down the height of the ten in here. Some people call us a tongue um, or tenon, whichever way. height 
here, so I'm still proud. Getting close. Okay, so now I'm gonna take my knife. So I've got I've got the basic height and the width of the inside of the ferrule. So now I've got to start rounding this. So I'm just gonna take a knife and cut away here. So you're just doing that outermost part of that tongue. Yep. And, you know, I've thought a lot about the best way to film this. And the best thing would be to have basically a camera right in the middle of my, um, between my eyes, so that you could see this the way that I see it. But that's kind of difficult. GoPros are still too big. A little bit too big. And they're not meant to be um, that close of a focus. At least I don't think so. Okay, so now I've got that rounded off. Kevin, che Kevin Chen's checking in from Taiwan. Hey, Kevin. He did not pass out today. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's way past Kevin's bedtime, but he's still trying to watch us from Taiwan. Okay, so the ferrule's going on, kind of. Get out the vise here. wax. So I'm going to now trim this back. Tell them about the bow that you made for Kevin. Kevin Chen is a friend of mine from Taiwan, and he wanted to make this really lovely bow as a memorial to his friend, his family friend, and uh, named Leone. And so we made this beautiful gold bow um, patterned after um, FN Voran, and we put a Stanhope lens in it made by uh, Michael Shively in uh, Mechanicsburg and um, if you go to my Instagram page you can actually see uh, a um, video of that uh, uh, looking right down inside that that lens okay so I've got that trim back Try to just sort of visually square this up. And I'm going to put a little wax on there. And then see how the ferrule starts to go on. You don't want to push too hard on this because you'll you will stretch out the ferrule. So why are you using the wax on the on the top? Well, it makes it go on easier, of course, but it also helps mark, uh, you know, wherever it's been shined up is where it's tight. So you can trim away and get it closer to fitting. It's really interesting if you get a chance to look um, at old bows when you're um, doing rehairs. You can learn a little bit about how they were made just by 
seeing the tool marks um, on the tongs, on the tenons of uh, some of the old makers. Sometimes they were filed. And you can see really coarse file marks. And other times they were, uh, they just used a chisel. Sometimes they're really quite crudely done. Um, they didn't waste a lot of time making this fit as perfectly. Okay, we got on there a little farther this time. Start trimming a little more off. Tim said he's not able to keep up with the frog making, so he's going to sit back and watch and looks forward to coming to work with us um, to help him get his shop set up in order. Well, the great thing is that all of these videos will be available after the live streams. So, Tim, if you want to go back and rewatch it and pause it until you get caught up, you can do that. And there's 21 hours of the day that you can get caught up on. So. Pretty good. Pretty good, pretty well. That might be more grammatically correct. Sarah has said, you mean you guys can be with me every bow I make? Yippee! Uh, Tyler asked if we've already cut the frog to its final length. No. We have not. Okay, so the next step, this is super important. So I've got the ferrule mostly fit. You can push it all the way on. It's still a little tight. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to push on the corner here with the corner right in the middle of the ferrule so that the ferrule goes on I'm not influencing how it goes on and um, I'm going to take my square and see how the ferrule itself is going on let's see it's a little bit crooked so I'm going to scribe a mark on here So I'm going to go ahead and square up the ferrule. It was, it was pretty close. Kate was showing me when we did our break here uh, something that uh, was posted, a meme, I guess, of Bill Murray and being Groundhog's Day. Oh no, coronavirus again. There have been some really funny 
um, song parodies that people have done about the coronavirus. One of them is, um, if you're a, a, a Queen fan, there's one of Rhapsody, um, uh, what's it called? Um, Corona Rhapsody? I think that's what it's called. It is absolutely hilarious to hear the, um, the lyrics to that. Okay, so we've got this squared up. Now all we have to do is make this gap between the two disappear. So I just go and mark with a pencil where they're touching. And I'll trim that away. Get rid of my silver scrap here first. So we're only taking up about three hours of their day. Is there anything else they could be doing with their time? Is there any podcasts that they could be listening to? Oh, good question. Um, I have um, some of my YouTube channels that I really enjoy watching. One is of uh, a guy named uh, Leo uh, Golding who's um, restoring a boat called Tally Ho. He's out in, um, uh, hard to say, Squim, um, Washington, out near Port Townsend. So that's that's been a lot of fun watching that. His the his craftsmanship is absolutely amazing. There's another guy if you like metal work. His YouTube page oh the um, Leo's Leo's um, YouTube channel I think is called Samson Boat Company. Um, there's another guy from, I think he's from Australia that does, um, metal work and his, uh, his YouTube channel is called click spring and, um, absolutely do not go to that web page unless you're willing to spend the next, I don't know, two or three days watching the amazing stuff that he's done. Is he the one that has the funny um, metalworking videos? Um, I wouldn't call them funny. Um, no, there's a guy named Frank Holworth. I think that's the right name. That um, he's pretty inventive with his woodworking. Now, the person you're thinking of with the um, funny videos is. Um, uh, this old Tony. Instead of this old house, it's this old Tony. And his stuff is pretty hilarious to watch, for sure. And informative, of course. Tony agrees. This old Tony's funny. This old Tony is funny. Not the Tony right. in the chat. That's a young Tony. Yeah. We don't know anything about this old Tony other than that's his name is Tony. Okay. I got it fit. It went really quickly, thankfully. Got a little bit of bulge on my silver, so I'm going to bend it back down a bit. See how it looks. Okay, I like it. So now I'm going to Ed Goltry said this old Tony's taught him a lot about machining. Not much I can clean here, I don't think. So now I want to get this um, uh, 
surface here um, so that it's all in one plane. So there's no step? There's no step there. Yeah, I would definitely, um, if you're interested in design, I would go to um, Kevin Kelly's um, um, YouTube channel and see some of the amazing stuff that he's figured out with, um, with design. Okay, so we've got that flattened, nicely cleaned up, and so now we're going to take the ferrule off. Well, I'm going to make some more filings anyways. Leave it there. Arrow up the... So we're just continuing that curve of the ferrule, the round of the ferrule here. Tyler asked, do you flatten everything again after you get the pearl slide fit? Um, I'm only flattening it with um, 400 grit, so 400 grit sandpaper, so not much. Really only just trimming down the, the pearl or abalone. Okay. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is narrow the sides, get them close, and they are darn close to being finished here. So I kind of leave this side here as sort of my, my master side, and that's when I'm doing all of my squaring and, and paralleling off of. So, keep everything nice and straight. And so I have my plane set for, so it's very light cut. So I've taken just the teeniest bit of a cut off of the 
ferrule itself on that. Okay, that's good. We'll go to the other side. You could inlay a roll of toilet paper on the side. <laughs> okay. Nice and parallel. Okay. Right now that's at like 13.1 and my goal was 13 so it's close enough. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to file the length of the ferrule and make sure that it's square. This is one of those more pleasant sounds. The microphone does not like that sound. No, me neither. You also woke up crocodile. I don't really bother measuring it from the, at this point. It's going to be close. It's not that important if it's 8.7 or 8.4 in length. I think the old makers, first of all, they, they, they didn't have a, a veneer caliper. They if, if they had a ruler that was any you know anywhere near as good as this it would I would be stunned they were just scratching a line planing or filing down to it and saying perfect well, it was done so okay I like the way that looks square enough and in fact if you can even see a lot of makers their stuff isn't square either so it's close but it's not perfect Lots of time. Yeah, we're only Let's at see. 33 minutes. Okay. Get rid of all this. So the next thing is going to be um, cutting it to length. So 45 and a half is my goal length. And I'm going to scribe this line too. So I don't get any chips. Okay, I could cut this by hand or I can go to the bandsaw and cut that off and um, that would be a whole lot faster um, than watching me sit here and file the daylights out of this. So I will be right back.
I mean, they're not really going to be able to hear me over the bandsaw. He had to go all the way upstairs. Sarah said, entertain us, Kate. Ah, oh, it's too late now. Okay. So I was thinking about this whole coronavirus thing that we're in the middle of. And uh, one of my pastimes is trying to write novels and just thinking about this plot. You know, you've got uh, a virus that's infecting the whole world and uh, it's about the most slow motion disaster you could ever imagine I think almost and uh, I think uh, you know the zombie apocalypse is actually a bit more believable than what we're going through I don't think anybody has watched the movie So I've got to cut this to length, of course, and now I'm filing it down and it's got to be square on the back like that. But as far as the height is concerned, it always looks best if this angle is more than 90 than less than 90. So 90 or less is not as aesthetically pleasing as being a little bit more and I think part of the reason is because the when you when you kind of when you look at it on the the look at the frog on the bow it's tilted I guess from your perspective it's tilted a little bit this way anyways and so if you look at old bows they're mostly um, more like 90 and a half, 91 degrees, something like that. Tony asked how you would cut it without a bandsaw. Uh, you would probably want to have like a back saw. Um, trying to do this with a coping saw or something that's not going to want to cut very, very nicely. You pretty much have to have a bandsaw if you're going to do this work. Um, you've got uh, um, you know, all that cutting to do on a stick. just makes sense to do that with a bandsaw. Okay, that's looking good. And that's good, okay. We got our width. Eh, I'm gonna go a little farther here. So I can see where my knife mark.
another nice noise. Just means you're working on end grain. Yeah. All right, I think we got it. Okay. So now we have, this is flat, cut the length, got this squared off, and now we're gonna plane this, or yeah, plane this down the height. So, plane, 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 there it is. Okay. So for the height of a frog on something that's so toured or percot school, sort of typical height is about 20, but you see things as tall as 21. I'm sure there's probably a few things that are a little taller. I want to keep this nice and square. And then on the height of the frog too, if you're going to error and not have this parallel, so it's taller on one end or the other, you want it taller at the ferrule than at the back. Just aesthetically, it looks better. Almost there. See what I'm doing wrong here. Okay, so now I have to, uh, I got my height, what I want, so it's a little bit over 20. I need to make a line here at one millimeter. And take my gouge and trim it down to that line.
check this. Uh, Tony would like to know what the grinding grind angle is on the gouge and whether or not you're using a burr. I'm definitely using a burr. I don't know what the grind angle is. It's probably a um, little bit more than 30 degrees. using a burr. And so what we're talking about on a burr, and so this is called a burnisher, and after I've got this um, sharpened, I'll take the burnisher and I'll just sort of gently rub it along that surface so I'm actually making a little bit of a hook on the blade so it'll catch the, um, the material a little bit easier than if it was just straight. And so really, you can almost shave things with that burr. Very, very handy. Okay, a little bit more. So when you were adjusting the height and you were bringing it down, the top actually gets wider. Yes. Uh, Tony would like to know what the width of the gouge is or the curve. The width looks like it's about, well, it's 30-ish. Yeah, 28. Uh, I don't know what the sweep is. It's probably a little bit more rounded than, than most people use. It's just sort of a, okay, here's a tool and it's going to work. And so that's what I've got. Okay. One more swipe here and we are done with the width. So this is now eight and a half millimeters wide and I'll go ahead and make my one millimeter mark here and here and so I can cut down to that line Jim would like to know what the thickness is of, uh, in the hollow of the frog. This dimension here is um, somewhere between probably seven and a half or eight. Um, I'm not sure what it's going to be on this frog yet. As soon as I get this trimmed down, I'll measure it. And we'll take our file here and clean this curve up. Again, this is my um, uh, Grobe Zero Cut Crossing File.
if somebody wanted to learn how to make bows, um, how would you recommend they go about doing that? Well, it's awful hard to do all by yourself without any instruction. Um, there's, um, I'm reluctant to recommend any any book. Um, John Stagg has a book that has um, some making and some repair in it, which is I think is quite good. Um, but you kind of need to just sit down with somebody and and uh, make a bow that way. You're certainly uh, uh, welcome to come to one of our classes. Typically, everybody leaves with a finished bow. Um, unless you break it, <laughs> then you get part of a bow done. Because we try to we try to have you start out the week making two sticks. Um, simultaneously and then when it gets to a point where you either get behind or you break something then you can just carry on with the with one of them so we do a class which is just making the stick and then we do a class which is making um, making frogs and David Forbes teaches that class so okay so now we have the bottom's flattened, the back is finished, our width at the top is done. This was super because I already started with a really small chunk of wood. This was super close to being um, uh, down the sides and it was um, uh, a little scary working on this. So now, um, now I can go ahead and work on the profile of the throat. So where are we at time-wise? We're at 53 minutes. So why don't we, let's see here. Why don't I go ahead and, and see how much of this I can get done here in the next, say, 15 minutes, 10 or 15 minutes. Then we'll take our break. So I'm starting by just making a heavy chamfer here. Tyler said Rodney's workshops are awesome. Everyone should go. We have a lot of fun doing it. And of course, you know, if you've got, uh, you know, say eight or ten people who are also learning, you get to learn by their triumphs and their mistakes, too. So, uh, you know, and then you get to meet like-minded people um, who are also learning and I know a lot of people from from previous classes have kept in touch and um, you know let people know hey I know of some wood that's a, for sale or something like that and and have um, you know sort of participated that way okay so I've got some chamfers on here now I'm gonna go ahead and start shaping the throat Tony said, so much fun, so much time to work. Yeah, we work, we start out at 8.30 in the morning, take an uh, hour break for lunch, and then maybe two hours at dinner time, go out to a restaurant together, have a little fun, and then come back and work until 9 or 10 o'clock. So uh, you get uh, way more than your 40 hours of work in in a week's time. Shelby said, true story, I can't wait to visit again. Nick said he's been trying to get back for years, but life is in the way. Well, just got to get those kids into college or something, then, then Nick, you can make your way out here. Okay, just keep Trimming away the wood you don't need. Can you maybe talk about the uh, different throat shapes? Uh, so, um, 
Tord and Picard did a throat that is more sort of a a D shape. So the the back of the D would be here, and then this was would be um, sh shaping the belly of the of the D. Um, there's lots of variations on that, and then. Um, Voran would probably be the first maker um, that did a very uh, rounded throat. And um, the earlier makers, the, the thumb projection here would go either parallel with the, with the stick or would actually close up a little bit when it came, a little bit like this is now when it came to the end here. Um, and then Voran kind of changed everything and he went very rounded throat, U-shaped throat, I guess, and then maybe more open at the throat and rounded the thumb projection to make that um, a bit more uh, comfortable, I guess, for players. Different aesthetic for sure. Cosman said, uh, asked if John Stagg is still in the, in the trade. He said he sees that his domain is gone and is finding some messages about how he was liquidating. Um, uh, as I understand, he's, he's um, not working at this point. But I don't really know. I don't know him personally, so I can't say. So my, the depth of my throat uh, is um, 32 millimeters. It seems to be real common depth for some reason. See that very frequently on older bows. I've looked and looked and looked trying to figure out where the golden ratio might pop up in... Um, in frog making, you know, sort of like it does in uh, violin scrolls. It's very prominent there. And I really just don't, I just can't find them. So it'd be interesting if, to know if anybody else has sort of come up with something. Are there any sort of um, stylistic um, things that you would recommend people stay away from when making the frog? Um, as far as the frog is concerned, one of, the, I would say, big mistake, um, design mistakes would be when you make the slide way too wide for the frog. Um, I tend to make my rails about three millimeters wide. Uh, where's the other one? So you can see that that's about three millimeters. It's three millimeters here, 2.8 up here. Um, if you make them too thin, too narrow, then they're just really fragile. Um, I want my bows to be around 100 years from now and, and not be things that are, are repaired a lot um, or, you know, have been broken. Um, scary thought is that you may be the best rehairer that ever rehairs your bow. So you better make your bow in a way that it can be kind of uh, rough handled. Um, 
if it's difficult to get the slide back in with hair in it, somebody's just going to jam it in there and uh, um, shove the ferrule on and it's going to start to, um, uh, I've, seen, I've seen frogs get stretched this way um, and then they get a crack on the side of the frog. So you want, you want some casual person you meet at a VSA say, oh, I just rehaired one of your bows. It's so easy to rehear. That's really what you want to hear. Um, maybe more important than hearing how beautiful it is, is it how easy it was to work on. Every once in a while when you're rehearing bows, you get reminded that you're supposed to eat your vegetables. <laughs> Sometimes people leave um, messages on the inside of, your, of the, of the um, slide. bottom side of the slide. So it's always kind of fun to see stuff like that. Won't mention any names, but somebody I know writes in uh, when they get it when they rehair a bow that somebody's glued in the plugs. She'll write in um, only hacks glue in plugs, <laughs> hoping that it comes back to the person who just had done the previous rehair. I think there's a, a tendency because people who are doing rehairs so often see these bows from China that are all glued together um, and they're thinking, well, it must be a accepted practice to glue plugs in. And... Uh, I wish it wasn't. <laughs> Every time you re have to remove the glue from the mortise, you end up removing some original material. So it's not a good thing. I think there was some guy, was he out in Oklahoma, that would drill a hole in the mortise and turn it into a glasser he would, with a nail? He would carve away the back of the of the mortise and then put a nail in so you could rehair it like a glass or bow. Yeah, that's not cool. Tyler said he saw a Hoyer recently where he had stamped the underslide and thought that was a nice touch. Okay, I think that's good enough for now. So we got the basic shape of the of the um, frog of the throat. So I don't really quite finish it up until after I've got the frog fit and the eyes in. So the next thing we're going to do is go ahead and cut the track for the slide, and uh, we're at and an then an hour and five minutes though. No, we're going to do the next video. We're going to oh. do. Um, slide track and then the hair track and mortise that'll be next all right, all right. see you in 15 minutes all right bye